Hello, our Cinnabar Moths, or any other kind of moth you'd like to be. Welcome to the Writer's Triangle, Cinnabar Moths podcast about all things publishing and books. Today we are here with Cynthia McDonald, our, our writer in resident, residence for Cinnabar Moth Collections. Cynthia, how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful, thank you. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to have you as well. And so yeah, I'm happy to be here. So today we're going to be talking about diversity in writing. And I was curious about when you first learned about the concept of diversity and what does that concept, what does that phrase mean to you personally? Um, it's interesting because um, I've actually been disabled most of my adult life and the um, there isn't a lot of disabled representation in writing Mm -hmm. so um i haven't really been aware of disability representation and there's not a lot of diversity um involved there so it wasn't something i was ever really even aware of until probably the last few years when i've really started um paying attention to some disability representatives who are um, really active in the community. So that that's really probably when I really started um, with my awareness of the di- of diversity in writing. Um, and for me, the concept of diversity really, um, when it comes to disability, has has a lot to do with things like accessibility and um, awareness and representation as far as how we are seen in society. Because disabled people in general are probably one of the lesser seen and more marginalized groups. Um, There right now, there's a lot of activism and awareness when it comes to groups like um, LGBT and, you know, especially in the news lately, there's a lot of like Black Lives Matter stuff, you know, and things like that. And I'm definitely not saying anything about like how marginalized those groups are, but there's not a lot of awareness when it comes to, um, disability. And when it comes to disabled people, we're technically treated very much as second class citizens because our accessibility is very limited throughout society. And um, when that is brought up, often we're treated as if that's something that we should not expect. Right. That that concept of, well, just work around it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. You should, like, we should find a workaround. Society should not be expected to accommodate us. Right. And so for you with disability, it's, my understanding, it's about the fact that there's not a lot of active and real discussion about it to kind of make sure that even people who aren't disabled are able to understand disability and come to it with a more uh, real mental image of what disability means. Exactly. And I don't think even people that really, really understand what exactly disability really encompasses because when people really think about disability, most people think about a person who is permanently in a wheelchair um, or a person who is completely um, hearing disabled or deaf or a person who is completely vision disabled or blind. Um, and there is such a spectrum of disability um, as far as like there are ambulatory wheelchair, people that use wheelchairs. Um, there are people who are partially hearing disabled, partially vision disabled, even to the point where people don't understand that if you need glasses, um, you are vision disabled. You know, like people don't think of that as a disability, but it is a disability. So everywhere throughout our society, disability exists and people don't see it. So that is a huge, um, lack of representation or even visibility. 
Okay. And, and so for for that and for that in writing, part of what helps people understand and helps people to see it is representation uh, in writing and being able mm -hmm. to see diverse diversity within this and representation of disability in different forms and being able to interact with it and conceptualize it and writing is one of the ways many ways available to us to yeah. uh, kind of show people what that experience is, is like and so for for you personally would you consider yourself to be part of diversity in writing i imagine you do but yeah it, if with that how would you say that you're contributing to diversity in writing right well i mean and of course that's a big two-parter because um as a part of diversity in writing um i represent a marginalized group trying to um become a, a recognized author in a very large world as the publishing world and what i what i have found is like it's difficult to get into that world um even when it comes to um representation again because there are a lot of um people there are a lot of publishers i should say even when it comes to small presses you know lit mags things like that that are saying we want to represent minority groups, marginalized groups, etc. But they don't they forget to mention disabled people or writers when they try to be inclusive. So in a way that that um is, is a problem. So I do consider myself to be a part of diversity in writing, so but it's a difficult it's a difficult niche to be a part of. Um, but then I feel like I'm contributing to diversity in writing as far as, um, when I do write, um, I try to put a focus on that as far as like my, my books, my main, um, my novels, um, what I can do is make, uh, the main character, the hero of the story, as a disability and that is something that disabled people never get to see when they are reading um, books um, most of the time when there are books that are you know about disability they're informational they're nonfiction you know things right. like that and even when there are books that um, are fictional that, that include disabilities, they're kind of that same, like I said before, they're that same societal expectation of disability where they're uh, the obvious, like someone permanently in a wheelchair or like permanently visually disabled or audibly disabled where, and that's all there is. There's nobody that's that can say like, oh, I have a, you know, I had a prosthetic or, um, I'm ambulatory, but I have like an in invisible disability that is chronic and I have pain and things like that. But they, mm -hmm. you know, or somebody with a cane and all those things, but people need to see themselves as the hero of the story and not just be a sidekick or, you know, a brief character in the story so i think as a writer that's one of the things that i really try to focus on is making sure that people with disabilities are seen and are the focus of the story right and so you want to have people who aren't just the more common commonly seen uh disabilities ha be able to see themselves written in books. I think something else that uh, you mentioned was the fact that a lot of the time the characters are either side characters or they have one of the like permanently vision disabled slash blind or are permanently in a wheelchair. And I think something that happens right. a lot. And I don't, and I don't want to knock those things either. I don't want to say like, well, 
I mean, just because somebody is like permanently visually disabled or permanently hearing disabled or permanently in a wheelchair, they don't deserve to, to be the, the hero of the story. I want to see all disabled people, like any disabled person, be able to read one of my books and say, finally, I get to see a disabled person as the hero. Like, that's yeah. me. That's a disabled person. I'm represented. You yeah. know, like any disabled person can see themselves represented as the hero in, in my books. You, you'd like to have the spectrum yeah. be represented rather than specific facets of disability represented. Yeah. You'd like to see the entire Yeah. Gamut. Exactly. Yes. And I think something else that's not really discussed with that that comes to mind is the fact that even when a character does have a disability in a story, they are oftentimes quote unquote cured of the disability for the purposes of the story. Yeah. For example, they gain a yeah. superpower yeah. that means they don't have to they can fly and so they never have to walk again, even though they still can't yeah. use their legs or oh. Uh, because they have yeah. um, ambulatory issues of some kind or something of that nature yeah. where it basically well, yeah. makes it obsolete. Yeah, but, and that too, There, I mean, and there are other things that are also problematic as far as there's a particular series that, I mean, and I don't want to like name out the series, um, but there's a character in the series who in the beginning of the series is like, Quite, is like quite disfigured and somewhat disabled who partway through the series becomes healed and beautiful and that's when she, that's when she's she's happy and then she's also and then everybody likes her and she's more appealing even to the audience you know that's and that's problematic because when she was disfigured and um like partially disabled then she was like not good enough right you know and that's that's not how it should be that it should be acceptable she should be good enough she should be you know heroic just as she was you know there should be no reason to heal her and fix her she doesn't need to be fixed you know I agree, which is why I said quote-unquote uh, cured, because I don't think it's something that is inherent. It Obviously, it, it's a thing that's a limiter on people's lives, but I don't think it's inherently something where it's always better just because you've removed it. I, yeah, I, exactly. And, and so with that kind of two parts to diversity is representing it and then also respecting it, you know, yeah. if that makes sense, is kind of how I think of it yeah. when it comes to showing these characters, but then also giving respect to the disability and to people who are disabled by recognizing they can still be heroic, as you mentioned, and they can still succeed yeah. just exactly. even with the disability. Yeah, yeah. You, even, even with the dis disability and any type of limitations they might have, even they even through their limitations they should still be able to um prove that they can be the hero and succeed and win the day like any other heroic story and, and so to increase on diversity and to increase on this rep uh on representation and, and things of that nature what do you think publishers and editors of literary magazines could do to kind of work to widen the scope <laughs> that, that that's a funny question because um when i uh one thing that i learned when i very first started um querying my 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 book my first book here that um john frangel which is basically i'm a disabled author querying a book with a disabled main character what I found myself running into was publishers and agents who were basically saying that they were looking, specifically looking to represent marginalized groups and, and marginalized um, characters. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I specifically targeted those people that were claiming that's what they were looking for. 
And I got, literally got rejection after rejection after rejection. And I think, and, and even looking out there to see what's available, um, by any of the, any of the, the big publishers or who's represented by the big agents or any of that kind of stuff. There just isn't representation for disabled authors. There's no mainstream stories about disabled people as the main characters. You know, there's, there's not a lot of that out there, you know, and I think that there's a lot of work to be done in the publishing world. Um, in that field, it's, it's just something that really has to change. Hmm. And so the and first I think that one, one, oh, go ahead. I was, what I was going to say, one thing I have noticed is that there are a lot of smaller presses that have really started to, um, change their, change their mindset and uh, ch change the mindset and like have opened up and said that they're being more inclusive and when they when they say that they're trying to represent marginalized groups disability is included in those lists which is a big change and i think that's important to notice hmm. yeah as one of those smaller press here at center of Mock, we do have a focus on diversity and we feel that we're mm -hmm. we're doing a we're doing our best and we do feel that we're raising the voices of uh, people who are in a diverse group of marginalized groups, including the disabled community, because mm -hmm. the mainstream point of view is kind of already known and a lot of the time the mainstream point of view is that disability isn't fully discussed. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, as that yeah. is, it yeah. kind of seems to be the viewpoint just based off of what we see out there. Uh, yeah. What would you say to those who might argue against diversity or claim that fo by focusing on diversity that we might be silencing or limiting the mainstream voices or the mainstream points of view? Yeah, I've actually had this discussion with um, <laughs> with people who um, are in the publishing world or, you know, um, even in book groups and stuff like that. And honestly, it just... <laughs> it, it's humorous to me because the entire publishing world has been representing white mainstream writers for publishing history. You know what I mean? And now we're trying to include marginalized groups and they're trying to bring up issues of cancel culture and um, pushing aside mainstream writers for marginalized writers and that's not how it works you know when you have a pie and you share that pie for it that doesn't mean that you get less pie if you're in 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 this group or that group you can share the pie with everyone you know there's still room for those white mainstream writers and just because we add marginalized groups in there you, we can all fit and share the same space you know there's there's not we don't have to lose space for one group to add space for another it's an infinite space it's kind of like there's an open plane that can be your garden and you can either plant all of this one seed which is the mainstream points of view or you can include all yeah. the different marginalized communities and everybody and suddenly you have this beautiful variety to your garden Exactly, exactly. I mean, if you, if you, you know, it's, if you just have like a whole bunch of white mainstream writers and I mean, what you have is a one particular audience and you're, you're missing out on a huge portion of people that you could be appealing to. So when you add more writers of a different group you add those marginalized writers in and then you just pull in a, another portion of your audience that you were missing out on you know people that now they see themselves represented now they want your product so you still have the people that wanted your original product but now you have an entire new um i think of the word you know a new audience for your for your product you have new customers whatever so you know you're just gonna sell more product you know, it just makes sense. I 
Yeah, I definitely agree that there is there's not a crowding out just because there's an inclusion of more. And I, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that that is. And a I, very, I think. Good. And I think honestly, what happens is when you have always had privilege, and in in, in, in in publishing, there has always been privilege. There's always been white privilege in publishing. There's always been um, able is privilege, you know, privilege in publishing, or however you want to put it. But when you have always lived with privilege, anytime you have to um, suddenly become live live like I don't know suddenly become equal have equality it feels like oppression you know and i think that's the problem hmm. and speaking of uh, oppression within your writing you you do touch upon a lot of pain and loss not necessarily always with oppression but with other things as well and so i was wondering yeah. what drives that kind of focus on pain and loss within your writing um, honestly, a lot of it is, uh, is a personal history. Um, and I mean, it, it's just, I mean, I don't know, you're, you're, my life just comes through in my writing often. Um, pain is just, pain has been a part of my life since, since I was a child and like with the, my disability and, and my, you know, and the cancer that I have now, I mean, it's just it's part of who I am and um, living with it is going to come through in my writing. And as far as loss, I mean, I mean, I've lost my father. Um, I disconnected with some family members and those are painful things. Those are, it's hard to lose a lot of those connections and, um, and also, I think that hard things like that are important issues to be a part of the stories that we that we read. I mean, everything isn't flowers and roses, and you're not going to have a good story if everything that you read is happy. I mean, you know, if you have to have pain to appreciate. Um, feeling good, you know, you have to have lost to appreciate what you have. Hmm. And, and so you draw from your own experiences, and then you also give it this focus part because you want it to be uh, seen and understood. And it's, I suppose, it's also part of just the experience of life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so you've been you you're currently a, a fiction author. You've you've written mm -hmm. John Fen Jill, which we at Sembra Moth have published, and we're happy mm -hmm. to have it. And I was curious: is what would be something that would surprise people about your journey to become a fiction author? Um, I think honestly, what would be interesting is that like, well, I started in nonfiction and wrote uh, four nonfiction books. But honestly, I think what would probably be surprising is that up until um, probably when I was, I mean, I started, I started writing the nonfiction when I was 40. And then um, I started, I wrote Drown Frangel in, um, sorry, I think, I don't know, two years ago. Um, yeah, I wrote it two years ago. And up until then, I wasn't writing fiction. So it took in, it took until my late forties for me to even write fiction. So it's been a very recent start for me, and I think that would surprise a lot of people because most of the writers um, that I read, you know, like I read a lot of, of authors that I really look look up to. Most of them have been writing since a very young age. Hmm. And so would you say that you haven't been writing for most of your, you weren't much of a writer when you were younger and it just started developing as you got older or would you say you've been writing your entire well, life, but you didn't really go into writing like novels and stories right. until later? 
Right. Well, interestingly, being a writer is something I always wanted to do because I've always been a voracious reader. Like reading was something I like disappeared into when I was a child. Like the library was my favorite place. I brought home piles of books and just read like crazy. Um, but even though I wanted to be a writer, when I tried to write, I just didn't know where to go with it. Like I would try to write a story and I just didn't didn't really know what I was doing. And then, you know, so I quit for a while and then I would like try again a couple years later and just start writing something. And again, I just didn't know where to go. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and then it was, it wasn't until, um, actually it wasn't until after I had the, the, um, that was diagnosed with brain cancer and had the surgery and recovered from that. Um, and that's when I started writing the nonfiction. Um, and I, I mean, as much as I loved writing the nonfiction, I found it tedious because there's a lot of research involved. And, um, it was actually Liz, Elizabeth Roderick, fellow author at Sin Barma, who, um, I knew on Twitter before we, either of us even got published there, um, who said, try writing fiction and you'll find it to be a lot more fun. You know, it, you can do a lot more with it. And I was just like, well, I'll give it another shot. And it was just easy all of a sudden. Just like, it's almost like something switched on in my brain and just, it was easy to tell stories. I knew where to go. Um, and... It's interesting too, because even though I just tried to write a story and didn't know where to go when I was younger, like now, as soon as I start a story, like I don't, I don't outline my books. I just like start writing and I just know where to go hmm. and just tell the story. Okay. So there, there was quite a bit of a journey where you wanted to do it and it just didn't click for you. And then suddenly it did after a bit of time. And you're not really sure yeah. where that came from, but here you are. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was just life experience. Maybe it wasn't the right time. But yeah, I just here I am, and it just like it's happening. Yeah, now I'm, I can do it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's really awesome. And and so with going into writing with the nonfiction as well as with the fiction, have you found the world of publishing to be particularly welcoming to your point of view and voice? I know that you mentioned that when you're trying to submit for marginalized groups that they didn't accept that being disabled is part of being part of a marginalized group. Uh, but right out within the spectrum of uh, publishing as a whole and that world, mm -hmm. would you say that you found it to be particularly welcoming or how has it been for you? Well, since, um, well, at least obviously Cinnabar Ma has been incredibly welcoming and supportive, um, with, um, publishing both, um, my novels and, and short stories as well. Um, I've also been writing short stories and sending them out to other, there's, you know, small presses, lit mags and other, um, publications and several of them have been very accepting and have published them, um, or will be publishing them as well. So, I mean, that there, there's been a, there's a lot of, um, support in those, in those areas too. And they're all very, I have to say, there's not competition between them. You know, they're all very like friendly toward each other and very accepting toward even, you know, everyone that submits. Even the times I've gotten rejections, and of course they still, I mean, still going to reject them. It's not everything is gold, but you know. <laughs> but when I, when I do get a rejection, it's always pleasant, you know, and it's always like, hey, this just wasn't for us, you know. Maybe try submitting it to someone else, you know. There's, it's not, you know, it's. It's not like it was before, where you know, or when I was trying with big publishing and they just weren't. Everything was cold, you know what I mean? Everything that I've done this last year has been really, like, warm and welcoming and really nice to... A lot of, like, I have found a lot of nice publishing people to work with. 
Well, we're happy that you have, and we're happy that you found us as well, and that you felt welcomed by us at Cinema mm-hmm. Moth. That makes me personally happy because I am part of the mm-hmm. team and we have worked together. Yeah. So I'm glad that you feel welcomed by me as well as everybody else. That's great. Oh, yeah. That's great. yeah. <laughs> and I think, that's definitely has <laughs> I think that it's wonderful that you've been finding other publishers and such who have been welcoming to, to your point of view, your voice, and to your submissions. And mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you if you had a piece of advice they would give to fellow authors who aren't in the mainstream, who aren't going to these big publishers and such, and want to write about topics or points of view that aren't part of the mainstream, uh, how they might, how you might advise them about going about that process. I mean, there's, I mean, there's always something to be said about trying to keep pushing it, the mainstream to see if they will see what they'll accept. I mean, I, like I said, I tried over and over again and got 35 rejections before I was like, you know, what this is, and I actually had considered self-publishing until I was, you know, had gotten to know Cinnabar Moth on Twitter and just said, hey, I'm going to give this a shot. Um, but honestly, if the mainstream's not ready to go there, then I think indie presses are definitely the way to go because, I mean, Cinnabar Moth is great and really... Um, accepting and but i also know that you guys are closed to submissions for several years because again you've been so wonderful <laughs> that i think you've taken on a lot of on good authors so um but there are again i've i've seen so many other um small presses indie presses on um and not even necessarily small but just indie presses on online that are welcoming and looking for those those marginalized groups and you know topics that aren't in the mainstream and i think it's important to like start supporting those indie presses and getting your message out through those presses and the more of us that get get in there the more those presses are going to grow and those books are going to get out there and i think Mm -hmm. I think that's the way to do it. I think that's the way to grow the grow grow what we need to what we're or what we're trying to do. Hmm. So your advice would be to be it's okay to submit to the mainstream presses, no problem with that, but don't ignore mm-hmm. the indie presses that are out there because you're trying Absolutely. to find people who are welcoming and are willing to support what you've got going on. Absolutely. Yep. And so for you personally, I wanted to ask for your writing in particular. Do you have a particular goal as a writer? When you were younger, did you have a goal? And has that goal kind of changed over time? Or what is your overall feel when it comes to writing? Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, when I was younger, you know, when you're a kid, you're like, oh, I want to grow up and be a famous writer, like Stephen King or something like that. Which, I mean, you know, he's kind of a one-off, like, (laughs) <laughs> happened to become a you know like famous writer and make a million dollars or something like that but as as where i am now i mean that's that's not my goal i mean i that it really isn't honestly my goal i don't intend to become super famous and, and make millions of dollars actually what i want to do now is just get my message out there and show people who you know it's about representation to me now um I mean, I love to write. I just want to keep writing. I just, I want to make a career out of it and just keep getting my message out there and just keep showing disabled people that they can be the main character and they can be the hero, you know, that's, and they can be represented in, in literature. Hmm. So that's, that's my main goal right now. It's a very admirable goal of spreading awareness and uh, providing another source for people to yeah. be able to understand disability. Uh, and mm-hmm. I want to ask you, for publishing as a whole, do you feel that outside of, I know that you mentioned the mainstream doesn't really have this, but and you mentioned that there are some indie presses that you've worked with that have been really wonderful. Would you say that mm-hmm. when you're working with these indie presses that there's a better understanding of the levels of diversity within the community and with your background with disability or do you say that there's still a lot of room to grow what what would be your take so far about how well it's understood 
Honestly, I, th I still think there's a long way to go. I mean, I, I still think that disability is so underrepresented and so misunderstood. Um, like even, even, even in the community, um, the, the publishing community that's trying to support, you know, marginalized and oppressed groups, I just don't think they have a strong understanding of, of, you know, like, the spectrum of disability and how important it is to rep to show representation of disability. I think the right, like, again, I think right now they're so focused on those groups that are, you know, garnering so much attention right now with the, um, again, the importance of their, you know, stance in public. I mean, and those are important stances and it is important for them to, um, gain ground and do that type of thing, but disability needs to do that too. And, you know, but, and, and again, that's, that's, we get missed, you know, and I think that that's, that's a place that I think even the smaller places need to pay attention and, and try to work on that. Hmm. And so if you had one message that you could get the pub in publishing community to hear and understand, if you could put in, for example, a couple sentences, what would that message be? Talk to us. Just, just talk to us. I mean, it, the the best way to represent this, the disabled people is to talk to the disabled people. If you really want to understand who we are and the, where the what the spectrum is and how to best represent us, just talk to disabled people. I think that, that that that's what gets missed out on is that we get talked about but not talked to. Mm. That's a very good point. That is very true. There is a lot of discussion about people without actually including the people being discussed. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yes, exactly. That's what happens. <laughs> and so that's a wonderful message, and I thank you for sharing it. Mm -hmm. And I'd also like to thank you, Cynthia, again, for talking with me today and being on the Writer's Triangle. And I'd like to thank all of our beautiful moths for listening to today's episode. Uh, Cynthia, can you tell us where we can find you on social media? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, NickCindy72. Uh, you can find me on both Instagram and Facebook at I See Your Hearts. Thank you, and uh, be sure for our listeners, be sure to visit cinnabarmoth.com or cinnabarmothliteratorycollections.com and check out the transcripts where we'll also have the social media, social media links for Cynthia. Thank you for coming on and talking with me today, Cynthia. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you for having me. Goodbye.